Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. We're at the end of the second week of the War of Ukraine, launched on February 24th by President Vladimir Putin. We're all shocked and saddened by the events and the human suffering they are causing. Over half a million Ukrainians have already fled to neighboring countries as the conflict is escalating. How did this happen? Could this have been predicted? Where is it headed? Let's discuss. Well, warm greetings, everybody. I'm so pleased to have uh, Brian Becker on our podcast today uh, with Greg. And um, I've been following you a lot on your observations about uh, the situation going on the other side of the country and the other side of the world and uh, would like to chat with you about that. But first, let me give you a little bit of an introduction. You are the national coordinator for Answer Coalition and Answer is Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. And I think that's how Greg met you through some of your, your activities there. You also are a prolific podcaster. You do podcasts three three times a week with the a socialist program on the uh, breakthrough news, which is, uh, I've spent a lot of time um, uh, watching you on that. You do a wonderful and informative job with that. And I think you're a teacher today in our podcast. So warm greetings to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good, good. Well, um, I want to start by uh, talking a little bit about your book, uh, Imperialism in the 21st century, and I have a confession to make. I'm kind of a recovering MSNBC liberal, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I've been going through uh, deprogramming with the help of Greg, and frankly, uh, I hadn't really read Marx until a year ago. We did a, a, a mm. podcast on Marx and was you know, quite amazed, and your book is the first time <laughs> The first time I really read Lenin, you edited this book mm. where the first where the first part of the book is you're talking about how he has application to what's going on right now in our world. And the second part of the book is actually Lenin's pamphlet where he right. talks about imperialism. So uh, start by filling us in on on Lenin and how what he was talking about in 1916 is got application to what's going on right now and and. Go ahead. Well, Marxists read Lenin or Marx or Engels, uh, not the way the Christians read the Bible. Uh, we don't think that what Marx or Engels or Lenin wrote was the final word or the word. Um, all of their writings, and in particular Lenin's writings, are always um, they're always in the middle of a fight or a debate or a controversy within the left in Russia and, and internationally. So in each of the each of the writings of Lenin, you have to kind of be in his head and understand who he's fighting with and what the issues are, rather than thinking about it as like now the great Lenin has spoken the way you know Moses came down with the Ten Commandments. Um, so when we when we think about Lenin's essay, it's a popular essay. It's a polemic against the others in the socialist movement who, contrary to their professed uh, pledge not to support their government when World War I started, uh, indeed did just that. And all of the parties, most of the major parties in the world, and certainly the German Social Democratic Party, which was the flagship party for socialism, uh, they had one third of the seats in the Reichstag, the German parliament, uh, with the exception of Karl Liebknecht, all of the members of parliament who were part of the Socialist Party actually voted for war credits. So when war came, the war fever came, the hysteria came, uh, when it's very hard to stand up against that sort of first wave or wind of patriotic fervor at the, at which accompanies the start of every war, they all capitulated, again, with the exception of Karl Liebknecht. And so Lenin was shocked. Lenin was really shocked. He was living abroad. He couldn't believe it. He actually thought it was the stories in the, in the mainstream media about the capitulation of the socialist parties 
was actually fake news. He couldn't, <laughs> he really couldn't believe it. He thought, no, this can't be. And, but of course it was true. And the, the Bolsheviks were that trend within the socialist movement in Russia who didn't support the war. And they, they suffered a terrible persecution. They, they're, they're members of the Duma, which was the, the czarist created parliament. They were put on trial for speaking, for not voting for war credits. They were actually put on trial facing the death penalty. And, the, and most of the socialists, the Serbian Socialist Party also didn't go along. Of course, we know many figures in the American Socialist Party didn't go along, including most famously Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs, yeah. Who was sentenced to 10 years at hard labor at age 66 for having given a speech, just a speech against entry into uh, American entry into World War I. So Lenin writes this book basically as an argument for why the socialist should have not capitulated, should have stayed true to their pledge uh, to carry out what he called revolutionary defeatism, meaning to prefer for the socialists in each country to defeat, to prefer the defeat of their own government, their own bourgeoisie, as opposed to their victory, because they all said, look, this is a war between robber barons and capitalists. Why should workers go slaughter each other? Why should the British kill the Germans and the German kill the French? Why not stay true to the idea of workers of the world unite instead of being dragged along into another nationalist uh, war? And so Lenin wrote the book in 1916, and he tries to analyze the war, World War I. And he says, the war isn't a mistake by the Russians or the Germans or the French or the Americans. It's not like there's rightness or wrongness on some particular side in the war. He said, this is a reflection. This war, which was unlike any other war in human history, World War I, where you know 18 to 20 million people killed each other in a matter of four years. He said, this was a byproduct of capitalism at a new stage of development, right. meaning what he called the monopoly capitalist stage or the imperialist stage. And so we reproduced the book because since 1914, since World War I, we, the, the world situation has changed a lot. In 1914, the, most of the world was colonized. Then it wasn't colonized after World War II. And after World War II, there were two centers of power, the socialist camp and then the camp led by the US. And then the socialist camp disappeared with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So we've gone through these different stages and phases. We, we republished Lenin's book and wrote our part, Imperialism in the 21st Century, because we tried to assess what is still valid in Lenin's original thesis from 106 years ago, and what would we have to amend, not because he was wrong, but because the world has changed. And we thought it was very valid. It was a monumental work. And by the way, it's, you know, part of what we wrote in the book is that, you know, when, when, the ideas or ideas, conceptions take hold among the masses of people or some sector of them, they become a material factor in the political struggle. And Lenin's thesis about imperialism was adopted by the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Cubans, uh, revolutionaries all over the world. So it still has validity, but it needs to be updated because this is not 1914. You know, one thing that I think that I didn't realize, you know, I realized that capital by its very nature, capitalism will, will consolidate. It will be prone to monopoly. It'll be prone to control. It will not see national boundaries. It will become an entity in itself. But his observations about the banks and finance being the kind of the last stages of this was fascinating. And, I, and he, he would have no idea how right he is. Would he? today right or he might or he might he might <laughs> uh, you know that's that's amazing it's, it's prophetic he was prophetic and, and and i don't mean that with the pro fit he was prophetic in the in the biblical sense of like really being able to see the trends of capitalism and it's as you're as you're saying pat it's completely confirmed i mean look at where we are in america after 2008 there are basically five banks left. And there were like literally 500 banks at the time he wrote that, right. that book. Yeah, I, in one of your podcasts, you were talking about the consolidation of the capitalist and how at the turn of the century, there were 300 car companies and now there are three car companies, you know, right. and, that, and communication being controlled by just a handful of companies. But the idea that that's, that's not where the game is. The game is the consolidation of the big banks being able to kind of 
control, manipulate, and and be the power behind behind this. Well, I I highly recommend people read this, and it will bring Lenin to light, and it makes him uh, is very approachable. And you did a you did a great job with that with Thanks that. Thanks so much. And uh, so, speaking of which, let's go to Ukraine, which is the reason I think. I want, you know, I've been following your work on this, and you have some very good insights into this. Uh, do you, um, Greg's most recent blog was uh, also on Ukraine in his ZZ's blog, and um, it's, I, I guess, if we look simplistically, we just say that there's this bad guy, Putin, who is, um, who's just causing all of the problems and he's meddling in this thriving new struggling democracy and it's just as simple as as simple as that and um what i think you've done is showed how the history that leads up to this makes it much more complex with nato and and how we in fact helped create putin <laughs> Uh, and it's it's not just as simple as a singular bad individual who's who, who's evil, and we need to push back uh, against that. That's awful simplistic, but give me some of your thoughts about that about uh, Ukraine. Yeah, those are don't no, but you're saying what you're saying is really important because it's like if you want to understand a movie and you came in in the last ten minutes of the movie and it's like, oh. I don't understand this movie. I don't understand the ending because you didn't see the first four fifths of the movie. Well, for the American people, they're coming in at sort of towards the end of the movie. This movie started a long time ago. And in order to understand what would have motivated Russia to invade Ukraine, you most importantly have to understand what happened from 2008 until today. And I can do it real quickly. In 2008, uh, there was a summit of NATO in Bucharest in Rum Romania, and the United States said, look, we're going to incorporate Ukraine and Georgia, two former Soviet republics. The, Russia was the anchor of the Soviet Union. That was one republic. Georgia was a republic. Uh, Ukraine was a republic. And there were 12 other republics within the Soviet, within the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So they were going to incorporate Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. And Russia sounded the alarm. Russia said, no, you're not. You're never, ever, ever going to allow you, Georgia or Ukraine to come into NATO because that would mean bringing NATO weapons, including the most advanced nuclear weapons in the world, not only into former Soviet republics, but these are the countries that border our Western border. That would be like us bringing nu our nuclear missiles to the US-Mexican border, US-Canadian border, and missiles that had a flight time of six minutes to their American targets, you would never let us do that. And, and so the US said, no, we're gonna do it. And the French and the Germans said, don't do this, don't do this. So the French and Germans were 100% not for the American plan. Four months later, Russia m moves its military into Georgia. And there's a struggle in Georgia between a pro-Russian part, the South Ossetia, <laughs> And the other part of Georgia, because a lot of these countries are have ethnic, geographic, cultural divisions. And then, okay, so now there are Russian troops in Georgia. Then Ukraine is basically still neutral until 2014, when there's a coup d'état. Literally, like it would be like January 6th on steroids. The the mob not only dispersed the parliament, but they had guns. They broke it up. The, guy, the president fled for his life, the democratically elected president, who the day before had withdrawn the police uh, from the area around the parliament. And that was part of an agreement signed between the government and protesters. And the US was an, observ is an observer to the agreement. So was Russia. So there was an agreement, bring the police out of Ukraine, out of the central Maidan Square in Kiev. The next day there's a coup and the leaders of the coup are the right sector the Azov Brigade, these are Nazis. They're the muscle on the street. And they overthrow the, the democratically elected, corrupt but democratically elected government of Yanukovych, who had the position that Ukraine would not join NATO, that they were gonna balance between East and West. They'd have good relations with Russia and the EU and America. He's toppled 
and a new government comes in and it's com with the complete 100% support of the American government, Victoria Nuland, John McCain, they're in the square handing out, literally handing out cookies to these protesters. And when the Nazis dispersed the Congress, they salute it as a great day for Ukrainian democracy. From that day on, Ukraine is no longer neutral. Ukraine is coming into NATO either formally as a member or as a de facto member. And in the Eastern part of the country where it's predominantly Russian ethnically and linguistically and culturally, the people are like, no, we're not gonna live under these Ukrainian fascists. And they start what, the, the, that's when these independent people's republics are created. Russia sees this and immediately basically carries out the annexation of Crimea, which is Russian. Crimea is Russia. Nikita Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine in 1954 when they were part of the same country. It was right after Stalin died, it was the interim. But for whatever reason, Crimea transferred to Ukraine and only then became Ukrainian. That was 1954, not so long ago. And the Russians take it back. And the reason the Russians took it back was that's where their biggest naval base was. So obviously the Russian government is not going to allow Russian territory to be have that huge military installation become a NATO military installation. So Putin supports a referendum where the people in, in Crimea actually get to vote. Do they wanna be with Russia or Ukraine? And most of them wanna be with Russia anyway, they're Russians. So from then on, from 2014 till now, Ukraine is moving steadily into the camp of NATO, more and more weapons being poured in. If, if you remember, Donald Trump was impeached the first time for sort of delaying weapon shipments to Ukraine by a few weeks because he was twisting Zelensky's arm trying to help him right. against Hunter Biden. But Obama... Obama had said earlier no to these weapons. He said, don't send these weapons to Ukraine because Russia is going to take that as like a, you know, the beginning of the war. Don't send these advanced weapons because they're going to be used against Russia. So the restraint is lifted under Trump. Then Biden continues the policy. Other NATO countries start sending in big shipments of weapons. And, and then Russia in December, and I'm, I'll try to close up here in December 2021, Putin has this end of the year press conference and he says, look, we're serious. We're not going to let this happen. You have to negotiate with us. Start talking. And Biden says, yes. Biden says, OK, we'll start talking. And they send Blinken and they start having negotiations. And the Russians have two demands. One demand, NATO, uh, Ukraine can never come into NATO. And two, whether it's in or not informally, you can't use it as a staging ground for advanced mm -hmm. weapons to which Anthony Blinken says, these are non-starters. Now, they reject Russia's demands. At the same time, Putin makes it very clear by amassing 150,000 troops in Russia on the eastern side of Ukraine and in Belarus on the north side of Ukraine, that if the negotiations don't go well, if plan A doesn't work, there's a plan B, which is to use military force. So Putin was obviously saying, look, we wanna negotiate, this can be settled, guarantee, give us a security guarantee and it's over, the, you know, we can have a deal. The Americans say no. And at that time, as we know now from these classified documents, sent more than a billion dollars of new advanced weapons to Ukraine in the last two months. So obviously the, the Russian government shifted its position and said, we're never gonna, they're never gonna negotiate with us in good faith. Once those advanced missiles are in Ukraine, they'll never come out. We'll never have a day of peace. Uh, war is coming. In, in fact, Putin in one of the, I mean, I, Putin's speeches are remarkable. They really should be studied. His speeches in February 21st and 24th. He basically condemns earlier Russian or Soviet leaders for appeasing foreign aggressors. He's basically elliptically criticizing Stalin for signing the non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1939. Uh, he said, you know, appeasement doesn't work. You have, to, you have to really prepare the country. And so obviously they made the decision that if war was coming anyway, if the US was determined to confront Russia, and of course the US official doctrine is getting ready for major power conflict, so they're not dreaming about this. Uh, Putin made the decision, which I think is a tactical, a tactical mistake, but, and, and not to mention the human, the human losses and suffering, which are devastating Ukrainians and Russians, uh, but he made the decision, if war is coming, let's 
act first so that at least the war will will take Ukraine, all of it, not just the East, all of it. Their, their plan is to take all of Ukraine and create the buffer by military means. He said, look, if you're not going to demilitarize, we'll demilitarize you. So that's where we are. Right. And, you know, it's like Greg's blog. The first sentence of his blog is everything happening today in Ukraine must be weighed on the scale of history, understanding in terms of the precedence and attach meaning and clarity to today's events. When you look at what Putin has been saying for a long time, this isn't this erratic. He, he's he's been telling people this is going to happen. He this hasn't been this doesn't come out of nowhere. This is this has been expressed over and over and over again. And part of the problem, as I see, is is the expansion of NATO and you know what since since it first came in all of the states that have come in to nato uh, and he, he he says don't do this don't do this don't do this and now there's a response to this and I, putin also putin also said you know recently that uh, in one of those speeches he said i've never said this before but i actually asked bill clinton whether we could join nato russia exactly and, 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 and we were told no. And then you have to ask the question was, well, if the Communist Party was overthrown in the Soviet Union and, and America told us that the Cold War was because it was the evil communists, but now you had the good capitalists instead of the evil communists, why not let Russia into NATO? Why not? What's, why wouldn't, they, wouldn't that have solved the problem? But the US actually doesn't want Russia into NATO because that would be treating Russia as an equal. And the U.S. doesn't want to treat Russia as an equal because without this sort of confrontation with Russia, the countries of Europe will actually gravitate in the direction of Russia. It's, it's the Eurasian landmass. Uh, Germany historically has a lot of trade and um, you know, diplomatic and political and even military relationships with Russia. So I think the U.S. didn't want Russia in and couldn't treat Russia as an equal even when they wanted to. By the way, Khrushchev offered the same, the Soviets offered the same thing in 1954. The Soviets offered to enter, they asked to join NATO and supported the reunification of Germany, but on the condition that Germany not be included in NATO. Germany had just invaded the Soviet Union and 27 million Soviets had died. And the US said no then. So, you know, when you look at the big picture and as Greg's blog has pointed out, uh, and has pointed out for a long time. Uh, uh, we now look at Russia as the big, big bad bully because they've taken this military offensive operation. But again, why, 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 why would they do that? Why would they knew what was coming? They're being sanctioned. They can't even, they, they're, they may default on their sovereign debt. Their central bank can't actually access its own reserves of $630 billion. I mean, they're being evicted from the world economy, which was completely predictable. They knew this was going to happen. Why would they do all that if they didn't feel that they were in a corner and a gun was at their head? Well, well and I think, you know, I think that that's, that's part of the trap that was laid. I mean, that's something I've argued that really this was just a trap set for Russia to walk into, and they walked right into it. Because if you examine the last two weeks, uh, the, the repercussions, I mean, these sanctions, the, you know, rallying Europe behind this cause and internationally uh, getting everybody to agree to this, uh, the, the, the Ukraine, that uh, Russia is a horrible, evil country, blah, blah, blah. It, it's played it in the U.S. hands. I mean, by, by invading, this happened, this thing happened. But I'm curious, I want to ask you something, Brian, uh, because earlier uh, you correctly uh, mentioned that Obama did not endorse this. He, 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 was, he liked to make a lot of noise about Russia, but he wasn't prepared to go this far and arm Ukraine. And I know he gave an interview to Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, exit interview, where he talked about Libya. And he talked about in his own administration, this group, which included Hillary Clinton and, and other chicken hawks, that was pushing all this. It was a remarkable admission on the part of a president of this country, that his own staff was pushing the US in this direction. And uh, uh, you find this in, in, in Germany as well. I think Merkel would have handled this entirely differently. 
it would not have collapsed in front of the U.S. the way that the Social Democrat and Green Foreign, the Green Party Foreign Minister collapsed because they are called warriors as Social Democrats. So what do you make of these differences in the ruling classes in the various countries here? Yeah, it's really important what you're you're pointing out because, you know, when when the when um, when Libya started, when the rebellions in Benghazi started against Gaddafi, and you know, there's the same sort of division within Libya, right? You know, there's the people on the east and the people in the center and the people in the west. They're demographically different. There's lots of potential ways to break the country up. So they have a rebellion during the Arab Spring against Gaddafi. And immediately the U.S. jumps on that, and you know the chorus of voices uh, are insisting. Hillary Clinton and the Washington Post are insisting Obama must act. Obama must act. And Obama didn't want to go to war against Libya. And I don't know if you remember, Greg. You you may because you you follow the events so closely. But Robert Gates also came out early, right before the bombing of Libya, and he said Libya doesn't constitute, doesn't possess any national strategic interest for us. Meaning there's no reason to go to war. He was like being real politic, like, okay, whatever you think about civilians in Benghazi, it's, we don't have a dog in this fight. It's not vital to American interests, meaning American imperial in interests. He, he's speaking as a spokesperson for the empire. He said like, let's not do it. And Obama didn't want to do it. So the Washington Post started writing article, uh, editorials called The Passive President, meaning they were attacking Obama for being passive, for not coming, stepping up and being a real active, manly warrior. And so uh, Obama, as was his custom, capitulated to the right wing. That's what Obama did. His own reflex, like Gates's reflex, was like, no, we don't need this. What's going to happen? What's it going to be like after we destroy Gaddafi? What's that country going to actually look like? So he was a voice of restraint. Now in 2022, all restraint is gone. And so the question is, was it Obama was different or are we living in a different era? And my feeling is, and none of us know with precision, we're not flies on the wall inside these rooms, but my feeling is that everything has shifted in America and it really uh, dramatically started really in 2013 and 2014 because Russia stopped its own policy of appeasing American imperialism, which it had done over and over and again, over again. So had China, for the, by the way. But in 2013, Putin comes back into office. He was mad that Medvedev and his administration had gone along with the Chinese and abstaining on the UN vote authorizing resolution 1973, which authorized the use of military force against Libya, presumably to defend civilians. Putin thought that was a mistake to have, to have done that. And, and he was right, of course, because as soon as America destroyed Gaddafi, they went right on to Syria. But Syria was a major Russian ally, unlike Libya. Libya was there, but Syria was, a real principal ally. And there was, you know, anyway, there's a long-standing relationship. And Syria has a lot, a strong anti-air for anti uh, air defense system that was is Russian, Soviet created. And then Putin made the decision: we're not going to let the Americans do to Syria what they did to Libya and what they did to Iraq, because now they're getting closer and closer and closer also to Russia and to Russia's principal allies. So Putin moves in and decisively changes the, the outcome of the war in Syria. So the Syrian government keeps the Syrian Arab army together. That uh, They have the support of Iran. They have the support of Hezbollah from Lebanon. And they defeat the, uh, the Al-Qaeda mo so-called moderate rebels or the Al-Qaeda rebels, the ones that US and Turkey and Saudi Arabia are backing. And America is very angry at Putin. Like that's like a turning point sort of with American relations because now, Russia is asserting its power, which it is because it's a big country with a major military. And then the next year or the same year, actually, Maidan happens. The protests in Kiev start. And so those two things and where Putin is shocked at first by the overthrow of Yanukovych, I think the Russians were not paying attention as the Maidan protests. They, weren't, they were paying attention, but 
they weren't that active because I think the Russians were very worried about the Sochi Olympics. They were really worried about protests, about international condemnation or incidents at the Olympics. So they were distracted. And the US pulls off this coup d'etat and then Russia, uh, Russia takes Crimea back. Okay, so now there's the flexing of Russian muscle, but then Trump comes in and the American liberals, the, the people who we think of historically, your MSNBC uh, folks, the people who are historically more liberal, more anti-war, more pro-peace, less militaristic, they now come to the argument and becomes an immediate consensus. Donald Trump doesn't really deserve to be president and he's been imposed on us by the evil Kremlin. So public opinion that was historically a restraint on aggressiveness, the liberals who were the voice of peace during the Cold War become the voice of extreme hostility to Russia. So you have the right and the liberal left within bourgeois public opinion merging into this giant super militaristic super hawk. And that's when neocon politics become, become the consensus. So if Obama became president now, I think he would be he would be like Biden, which is in a way, I think Biden probably knows better. He probably knows this isn't really that before. I think Biden was worried about this. But look at who his advisors are. Victoria Nuland, Maidan, Kurt Campbell, Jake Sullivan, uh, Anthony Blinken. These were the Maidan crew. These are the people who carried out the coup in 2014. And I, you know, back to my um uh, confession about the MSNBC liberal, you know, when in the last year I've expanded how I'm seeing media by watching your program, The Gray Zone, Aaron Maté, um, uh, reading uh, Matt Taibbi, um, things like, for example, the Russia hoax. I remember when the Russia hoax came out and I, I, I was so uh, frustrated that uh, Matt Tahibi was saying that there was this was n exaggerated and manipulated. He he's right. <laughs> he's he's absolutely right. And you know the gassing in Syria, the gray zone, all the things that they did there. I, that's holding up as being more accurate than not. Oh yeah. And 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 it's and now you've got. Um, you know, Condoleezza Rice being paraded on the cable networks talking about how horrible it is that we're invading a sovereign country. Even Vindman, who was on, Colonel Vindman, who was on that call uh, with the uh, the very perfect phone call, was asked on MSNBC the other day about the Nazi issue in Ukraine. He said, that's just a made up fantasy. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> there are these fascist you know, uh, uh, groups of people that have really shaped some of the politics in that in that country, and it isn't just a fake news made up. I I don't know. I, it's it's frustrating because the whole narrative is being um, reshaped in a way that I think has a lot of mendacity to it, and it's not and it's dangerous. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. No. Those are those are all true things. I mean, it was. I went to a I went to a party with some really smart people who were former, they're older folks and they were, they were um, former like in, they had different positions in the US government and they were, they're all retired now. And they're, they all follow MSNBC and they're really true blue liberals. They support civil rights. I mean, generally speaking, they grew up as the better side of the government. Like the people who would have liked Ramsey Clark, for instance. Right, right. Um, and uh, they were I, they were telling me about all these stories about how once the Mueller report came out, that was going to be the end. We were going to prove it. It was going to be proof positive uh, that that Russia actually created Trump. That the Internet Research Agency did the thing, and it's going to it's going to be the end of Trump, basically. And I was like, I said to them because I was following it every day. Uh, I had a podcast, the two hour long podcast every day, so we were meticulously examining everything. And I was like, no, they're not. The Mueller report is going to show there was actually no collaboration between Trump. And they were, they not only did they not believe me, they were angry. Right. They were angry. They were personally angry that I would say these words, even though 
when I talked to them about the specifics and the facts, and I knew like a hundred times more than they did because I was following it so closely, they they couldn't hear it. It was like it was like a religious thing for them, like an article of faith. And you know, when you have a religious view, you don't really require proof. You just believe. Correct. So um, so you know, that's how I'm I mean, that's the sad part of all of this is that. You know, when Trump came in at first, we had so much, it was so promising, like all of us were in the, at the airports and in the streets and there was the resistance and young people were joining socialist groups. And it was, and, and then within a couple of months, the Democratic Party transformed the opposition to Trump into really a reactionary opposition, which is pretty hard to do given how reactionary Trump is. But they actually made it like he was more pro, they, they were more pro-war than Trump, like they were angry at Trump that he went, wanted to sit down with Kim Jong Un, and finally end the Korean War. Like that was him, like you know, like buddying up to an autocrat like himself, as opposed to like, wait, wouldn't it be good to have peace in Korea? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to end that war? Wouldn't it be good to withdraw American troops? Wouldn't it be good to not having everything at the brink of like another regional or even global conflict on, on Korea. So historically, those would have been the people who would have been for peace in Korea, but now they were so they they conflated Trump with all of these policies. And so the whole country at one level moved to the right. Uh, and that's where we are right now. So the country is primed. And as Greg said, I think Russia did walk into a trap. Maybe they felt there was no option. Maybe they knew they were it was a trap and they were gonna just go in and win and change the facts on the ground and endure this phase. I mean, they must have thought that. I mean, Putin can't be so naive. I don't, I mean, I think his I never thought of him as this great chess strategist the way other people do. Like it seemed like he was appeasing imperialism until he couldn't anymore. And then he was having sort of a, a reaction. And, and, and then his speeches in the last days became very angry. And you know they became against, why does Ukraine even exist? And it's that Lenin and Lenin's policy towards the national question in, in Russia. And like all these historical grievances, well, who was that pitching to? He wasn't pitching to Ukrainians. He was pitching to the Russian right. And so I think... Putin basically in the United Russia, you know, they were losing elections to the communists, uh, regional elections. And I think there's a lot of political problems inside the Russian establishment. And they're, they, I think they were thinking, well, if we have this quick confrontation with Ukraine, if it's quick, it'll be like Crimea in 2014 when there was a wave of nationalist support for Putin because he was defending Russians in Crimea. And so if, if they had succeeded right away, maybe it would have strengthened the hand of his political or group. But what they didn't anticipate, I don't think, is that Ukraine was gonna resist like this. And because the battle is dragging on, because it's not over in 24 or 48 or 72 hours, public opinion has shifted. Germany and France are 100% with the United States. Switzerland, Finland, these were the neutral countries in the middle of the Cold War. They wouldn't give up their neutrality. They're now on the side of NATO. So Putin has succeeded at uniting all of the, all of the imperialists and others against Russia by carrying out this military operation. So I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there will be some something else will come from it. But it seems to me, as Greg is saying, I think it's a huge um, problem for Russia, and it's going to be a huge problem going forward. How do, how does this how does this end? How does it end? I, I mean, know. even if uh, what what really really uh, struck me about your analysis is you've kind of answered uh, much of the U.S. left, which is became enamored with Putin. You know, the idea because Putin defended a small country, Syria, against uh, U.S. foreign policy initiatives, U.S. foreign policy plans because Putin turned at one point to uh, uh, offer some aid to Venezuela, to other countries that were strong-armed by the US and were under the, uh, Cuba, uh, were, were, were singled as, out as US enemies. Because Putin was, was, was doing these things, there was a certain elevation of Putin into some kind of anti-imperialist hero. Right. 
And, and when I read your material, I saw the podcast with uh, Abby Martin. I was very much impressed with your dispelling of that because it's a dangerous thing to go down. And, and obviously, uh, it's, it's that those views are held by people who have not read Lenin, and they should read Lenin to, to really understand the nature of imperialism. Um, so so what, what do you think, what, what do you think this is going to go? We're in a very dangerous, dangerous situation right now. I mean, it's really, it's frightening. Yeah, well, Putin, and, and just to, before I just respond to that, also, Putin doesn't care about the left. You know, the left might have cared about him because he took these actions that appeared to be, you know, confrontational with the U.S. But when you think about this action, the Russians denied, denied, denied that they were going to move into Ukraine. So all of the people who were sort of anti-NATO were saying, oh, this is just a made up thing. Russia is not going to invade. And then Russia invades. And so it cuts the legs out from those who are anti-NATO, who just look like they were naive and you know not listening to the reality of, and truthfulness of American intelligence. And, you know, and there was no preparation for the Russian population or the Russian troops. Like if you're going to take people to war, you have to kind of get them ready for war. I mean, it's a big deal to, to go to war. So he didn't care. It, this was sort of a, a Bonapartist type action where, you know, you use significant military forces to, to have a, a, a good outcome for you. And it's understandable they have legitimate national security concerns. It wasn't because it wasn't like invading Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, thousands of miles from Russia. They were, they were worried about their own self-defense, but the tactic was, it showed a complete disrespect or disregard for how it would be interpreted by the world. Okay, so then question is, how does it end? If Russia conquers all of Ukraine, which is their goal, they're moving up from the South and then to the West and all the way to Poland, um, they had hoped that the Ukrainian government would crumble and the military would surrender right away. That's not happening. So there's going to be more and more of a real war and it's going to be bloodier and more people are going to die and it's going to make Russia look even worse. Then they take, let's say they, uh, let's say in a month they finally win, which is very likely. They win. So what have they won? They now own Ukraine, basically. Uh, Hillary Clinton made it clear the other day in her own inartful way, uh, saying, well, let's have an Afghan type insurgency. Uh, we did that in 1979, 1980, 81. She said, that didn't work out well for the Russians. We can do the same. And then she, she remembers, she says, oh, and there were some unintended consequences. <laughs> um, like, I mean, what a, I mean, American, like, how can you be that person and still be like considered a serious political figure? But anyway, I think that is the plan. The U.S. will now, if Russia wins, the U.S. will then carry out guerrilla war against Russian soldiers in U and U Russian forces and Russian institutions in Ukraine. And um, it will look like justice is on the side of the insurgents because Russia violated the UN Charter. Russia violated the borders and the territorial sovereignty of another country that Russia is obviously the invader. So it would be like the super right wing US led armed struggle against Russia that could go on and on and on. Or the other out outcome is enough pressure builds in the West as the casualties mount that the US is the US. Biden administration is pressured into taking some action against Russia directly. 70% of public opinion now supports a no-fly zone. They, the people don't know what that means. They think no-fly zone, oh, that means Russians can't bomb Ukrainians, good idea. Not recognizing that a no-fly zone means the US commits to shooting down Russian planes over Ukraine. And Russia has made it clear even when they even they made it explicitly clear that if any of you join the conflict, you're party to the conflict, meaning you're uh, a, a legitimate target. And Russia put its nuclear uh, forces on high alert. Now, I think they at least said they were doing it, whether they did or not. They, they were signaling to the West, be careful, be very careful. And, you know, I agree with you, Greg, that this is actually super dangerous because 
this is, you know, both sides kept climbing the escalation ladder, the U.S. climbing first. A politician gets like a kudos for climbing the escalation ladder because they look tough. Right. They look manly. They look, you know, whatever. But when you try to climb down from the escalation ladder, when the other side hasn't, then you look like a weakling. So what politician is going to climb down? That's how wars start. You keep climbing up the escalation ladder and inadvertently something finally happens. Somebody's, a jet does get shot down. You know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we all, well, not everyone, but you know, we, we should revive it or you all can on your podcast. You know, there was that, that submarine crew in the, from the Soviet Union that was- I got, the, got the message to shoot and he disobeyed. He disobeyed because he thought, no, this isn't, we're not, they said, no, we're at war now. The war has started. And he was like, I don't believe it. Right. So he had enough authority within that submarine command, which was inadvertent, actually. He was just transferred to the submarine and he had enough authority that he could be a veto on the decision. They were going to launch nuclear torpedoes against American ships. Well, what would Kennedy have done? Kennedy was already being called weak by the Pentagon. He would have authorized the use of nuclear forces and we wouldn't be having this podcast today. I mean, it was actually that close. Well, I would you know, rec. Oh, go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, just just uh, before time gets away from us, uh, I was so impressed with your uh, discussion with uh, Abby Martin of the role of the left today. What the left should be doing? What it, what what can we do? How can we have an effect upon this in the United States? What can we? Uh, how do we organize? I mean, right now, as I pointed out to a friend recently. If you go out and you want to get into an anti-war demonstration, you're going to be standing next to Ukrainians screaming, glory to Ukraine, bomb Russia. Uh, no, you know, that's where we've gotten because of this foul uh, situation. So what should we be doing, Brian? What, what should be our approach? Well, uh, you're right. The, the, wind, the wind against us is very strong. And, you know, you you have to bend with the wind a little bit so as not to be completely destroyed. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to bend too much because you have to, you know, you, we have to keep going forward. Right now, it's very hard. Like in Washington, D.C., some people were telling us, I won't mention the names of the groups, let's go out and demonstrate with the Ukrainians who are saying no war. And we were like, no, you can't do that because they actually want NATO to be the Air Force for the government. Like we can't, if we come out with signs that say abolish NATO, dissolve NATO, which is our slogan, if the road to peace is to go back to negotiations, give Russia a security guarantee and begin the abolition of NATO. If you go to those demonstrations with those signs, you won't be protesting with them. You'll just be physically fighting with them. Uh, they have, the people are carrying Azov battalion uh, and right sector flags. I mean, there, it's not the majority, but there is certainly a fascist presence there too. So those aren't really anti-war demonstrations. They're just really anti-Russia demonstrations. And if you go out and only make your program abolish NATO, which is which is our program, the first, the, the most urgent question you're going to be asked is, well, what, what about the bombing, what about the invasion by Russia of Ukraine? Where do you stand on that? So so this is an unfavorable political environment. It's a very unfavorable political environment. What we're gonna start doing, um, and this is kind of a preview to it because we haven't finished it yet, but what Answer Coalition is gonna start doing is we're gonna start mass distributing a brochure that we're making right now called Why You Should Oppose a No-Fly Zone. And we think this is a way of starting the conversation with people. Start with the conversation uh, of the no-fly zone, and then the brochure sort of explains how did this work, why a no-fly zone will lead to a nuclear war, so it's not a good idea. And then also that gives us a chance, once we're engaging with people on why the thing they think is good, which is the no-fly zone, is actually bad. And you can talk to them about that. That's a reasonable conversation. And then start to say, well, how did the crisis happen? Where did it you know, then we go back to what happened in 2000, what, what, what Russia was demanding, what are Russia's demands, that Ukraine be neutral, that it not have advanced weapons on their border, that that actually is, a, that's a legitimate position. 
Why, instead of going to war or having a no-fly zone that risks nuclear war, why not actually sit with the Russians and resume negotiations and, 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 and uh, adopt, recognize that neutrality would be fine. Neutral, there's nothing wrong with neutrality. And then go back into, and then the other part of our brochure is like, how much do we spend for war? How much, I mean, right now, the Wall Street Journal editorial from yesterday was saying, Biden needs to do what Jimmy Carter did in 1979, which is to begin the rearming, that this is the answer to Biden's aggression, I mean, Putin's aggression. Uh, of course, Trump, Reagan doubled the military budget while, we, and while cutting social programs. So we want to say, look at all the money we spend for war, 50%, 53%. 50. So we're, trying, we're starting at a low level, in other words, politically. When you start with, uh, don't be for a no-fly zone, that's a low level. But we think that's a way for the movement to start to engage in discussions with larger parts of the population and then raise our, and if you can engage in that conversation. So we're gonna put a, we're gonna hand out thousands or tens of thousands of these brochures in Washington, DC. We're gonna go to the subways. We're gonna start these conversations. And we think that that may be the best tactic for the moment because it's hard to see how under these circumstances you have a large scale anti-NATO protest. I don't, I don't think that's in the cards at the moment. I think we're starting at a lower level. And, and then from an ideological or political point of view, the point that I was making in a conversation with Abby Martin is like, we have to be, we're so like, I'm a socialist, I'm a Marxist, I'm an anti-war, lifelong anti-war organizer. And so, I don't think it's, I think it's a big problem to put the leaders of other governments who happen to have a contradiction with the United States on some kind of pedestal, like Putin, right. or anybody really. Like, instead of doing that, our movement has to be independent, in order to be, meaning politically independent, like we have to be thoughtful about what's the conversation like in the United States? How can we move people from where they are to the next step? You know, they're being bombarded with all this mainstream media. And if you come out, like my, my daughter, who's 21, all of her friends who were with us in all of the protests in the last two years, at BLM protests, at anti-war protests, they're like 100% against her right now on Ukraine because she's saying the same things that I'm saying and they can't hear it. They re really can't hear it. So you can't, if they can't hear it, there's no point in saying, like just having saying words that people can't hear. We have to start to find a way to have begin the discussion at a different level. And I think maybe since the no fly zone is now a fad, maybe we can go at it that way and then be independent politically. Don't follow, don't say, oh, because Putin is in a confrontation with NATO, Putin is somehow our leader. He's not, Putin is an anti-communist. He's, he's actually, there's nothing really progressive about him. It's just that in his position as president of Russia, he has like a foundational reason to defend his country against the designs of US imperialism. And it doesn't really have anything to do with socialism or anti-capitalism, right. not at all. Right. Yeah, my last podcast I had and my on the back here, I had the U Ukraine flag. And then I thought about it and I thought, what the hell am I? <laughs> It's the same thing as this virtue signaling, just like I had uh, I had on top of our Christmas tree. I had a picture of uh, Mueller when the Mueller report, because he was going to be my savior. Then I actually read the report and thought through it. And, it, it, you know, the left is so schizophrenic. We're so um, I don't know. And, the, and, the, and at a certain point, the, the labels left, right really do. Uh, start to become confusing. I don't mean the like I'm in the Marxist left, socialist left, but when I think of the Democratic Party, and because they're to the the right, the Republicans are so right wing that the Democrats seem left wing, or the Democrats historically were more for civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, when you think about the Democratic Party, I really 100% reject the idea that this is left because yeah, right. they are so right wing, and they'll. They'll take people like us and, you know, if it was by a vote of what to what, you know, we'd have the guillotine because if you stand up against the empire right now, you're really in the crosshairs, but all the more reasons to do it. 
your your respect for history, you appreciate this, but you know it's it's an old story. Again, we we look at a history of the McCarthy era, and it's exactly the behavior of the Democratic Party in its essence and liberals in that period from 1949, 1950 on, the Korean War mucked it all up for them. And they became arch anti-communist and anti-union and anti, you know, anything progressive during that era. So what it says is that the, the grasp of progressive politics is very weak with, with that sector. But what do you make of the two party? I mean, beyond just the weakness of liberals, what do you make of the two-party two system when a Democratic Party has lurched to, to, the, to the right? In the past, it's moved in that direction under the pressure of change. I mean, Reaganism, in 1986, the Democratic Party changed course and embraced what's called neoliberalism. But now they've lurched to the right in terms of foreign policy and in domestic policy. They got nothing done in this last uh, uh, session with the, uh, the big Biden plans. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the problem. This is the really, in many ways, the problem for the left, which is that, you know, the if we, in order to have credibility, you have to show that you can actually be the leader, uh, an alternative leadership in society. But there's no way for the left to go into the Democratic Party and and retain its political clarity and independence because the price of admission is that you have to endorse the overarching policies towards in foreign policy, especially. And so even the most progressive forces like Bernie or AOC or the squad, they're, they don't say a word about these, something like this, like what's going on, nothing, nothing good, I mean. So that's the problem, like how does the left show itself? The, the two parties are, it's right and, and far right. You know, my, I, my friend Randy Credico, the, the comedian has a great joke, which I always tell a little bit wrongly. He says, there's a fine line between the right, the far right, and the third Reich. And he's, and he's not wrong there. And, and so the two parties don't really give us an open, there's no, there's no opportunity for our side to really be heard for the left, the real left. Even though our program, when Bernie starts to talk about our program, when he was in the debates, like, Tens of millions of people, 80% of young people say, yeah, that's what I want. I want, I want the president to talk like Bernie Sanders. I want him, I want those things. Like our program, that's the socialist program, right. you know, the part of it at least. And that's very, very popular. But because we're cut out of the mass media and the two party system is just a complete lock by monopoly capital on politics, the, the problem for us is how to, how to find our voice. And you know we have alternative media like your podcast or our podcast or Breakthrough, and we're we're spending a lot of time and we're developing those alternative media sources. But when you look back at where real progress was made in America, look in the 30s or in the 60s, you see in the in the in both cases there was a strong grassroots political left that was rooted in the working class that was rooted in the communities. So you had the Communist Party and as the most important party in the 30s and then some other smaller socialist parties. But generally speaking, you know, the left was very strong in the 30s. Roosevelt didn't give social security or unemployment insurance or the things that we now consider to be fundamental to democratic economic rights as a gift. That was just because there was a strong militant left. And in the 60s, I mean, the Congress that passed the Civil Rights Act in 64, the Voting Rights Act in 65, compositionally, it was the same Congress that in 1954, 10 years earlier, was upholding apartheid in America. Right. The composition of Congress didn't change. What changed was the people changed. The people stood up. The people felt their energy and their strength and their power. And they created this new political climate in America. So right now we're going through a tough time, unlike 2020 summer when 35 million of us were in the streets after George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and that very hopeful political period. Now things have shifted. It's very right wing. It's very hard. But I think the most important thing for us is not to forget what it was like two years ago. Like this period will pass. This phase will pass. That people 
don't be just think about hand wringing or deep, you know being too pessimistic. The crisis of capitalism is existential climate catastrophe, endless war, the elimination of 70% of the jobs that we now know exist in society will be gone in five or six years. These are the crises of society that capitalism can't solve. And that's why I remain very, very optimistic that we can build or rebuild or revive a new socialist movement, learn the lessons of the past. But, you know, with the young people, especially as the new leaders, where those of us who have, who are formerly young, um, you know, are there as a resource, uh, but really where we build a cross-generational movement that really uh, believes in change, as we could see with all the millions of people coming out for Bernie, people wanted change, believed in change, were ready to fight for change. They got frustrated because it was inside the Democratic Party. There will find, we'll have to find a way in spite of the limitations of the way the political system is constructed for these yearnings and aspirations to find an outlet. And I think that will happen. And we need more Howard Zinn. Well, but uh, wait, oh, wait, he, he's been banned in our schools, I forgot, with the people's history. You know, but his well, whole he idea- is the truth, so he should be banned. It's not allowed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm trying to get uh, Greg to finish a book, uh, Richard Hant, Hanania, who wrote the book Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of the Grand Strategy. Are you, have you had him on your podcast before? No, yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, he, he wrote this book that says we're under this illusion that our foreign policy are just smart people in the room who are um, making, you know, making good decisions and are well thought out. And, and he says, basically, it's foreign policy comes from government contractors, the defense industry, national security bureaucrats, and the influences of other foreign governments. It's not a cohesive plan. And I, I'm not I'm not hearing the, back to the Democratic Party, I'm not hearing them um, talk about uh, doing anything about the defense industry, you know, and the Pentagon budget. And I, where are they with the national security bureaucracy and all of the uh, increase that's of uh, spying on the public that's occurring with that? I, the chirp, chirp, not a thing. And the foreign governments, all of the other influences of the Israel and, and so forth in our policies. And it's, um, it's just kind of frustrating because they're just they're just useless as a, as, as, as a, as a group. And that's why it's it kind of like um like a chain around the neck of progress holding it back um because you know people think well the only way to really make a difference is through congress or so on and the only choice on the only choice we have is the democrats so as bad as they are they're their best option when in fact that's not true the democrats are like a chain it's like the mirage the illusion of of choice right and, right. and I think you're, you're right about those other elements. I don't think America's foreign policy is going to change. It's not going to get better. It's not going to get more liberal. It's not going to become more, more peaceful. The, the Democrats increased the military budget more than the Pentagon asked for in the last session. And this is when the Democrats control the House and the Senate. So if they put another $10 billion, that, which would be one-sixth of Russia's entire military budget, $10 billion more on top of the 758 billion that the Pentagon requested, they did it because they wanted to do it. They, nobody had a gun to their head and said, right. you must do this. They wanted to do it. They wanna show how warlike they are so that when the Republicans accuse them of being weaklings, they can say, no, we're not. Uh, mm. We're giving more and more and more to the Pentagon. So that's a lost cause with, yeah. with the news. I agree, I agree. Brian, you are just a breath of fresh air. I'm going to link to your podcast, and I strongly uh, suggest people um, uh, start to follow you and and your writing. And who's your who's your colleague? You often do work with Eugene. Um, oh, Eugene Perrier. I love I, him. He's a yeah. He's, Eugene is great. Eugene, my show. I do my podcast three times a week. The Wednesday, the th Wednesday Thursday show comes out as a breakthrough news YouTube video as well. So we. We, I collaborate with Breakthrough, but Eugene is the uh, center anchor of Breakthrough News 
uh, a network. And so yeah. that's a really bur building burgeoning network. It's really exciting. And uh, he was gracious enough to, he and I did five separate episodes on Ukraine. I did another one yesterday, which is out on YouTube last night. And then this morning with Ben Norton, where we took up the, the political question, uh, is Russia imperialist? Uh, which we thought was an important political discussion. Mm -hmm. Our view was that uh, Russia is a big country, it's a major country, but it's not part of the imperialist club. Not that it wouldn't like to be invited to be part, but um, that it's, it's, there needs to be a more profound understanding of what's motivating Russia. It's not two imperialist camps kind of facing off against each other. We, we don't do that. So this was a long discussion with Ben Norton yesterday. It's out today. Uh, mm -hmm. Ben is a very you know, prolific writer and researcher, so I, I would recommend people check that out as well. Good, good. Thank you and, so and much. And subscribe to Greg's newsletter, which right. I, yeah, see, I know, which I always I read. And yeah, thank yeah. you, Brian. Thank you. Right, um, Greg. Great, it, Brian. Great to see you again. Great to see you. The next time, the next time we see each other, I hope it'll be at that same bar. In, uh, <laughs> it's still there. It's one of the few good. things that are still. I really there. like that place. Good. That was good. fun. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, thank you, See you guys. Thanks. Mm -hmm.